It's time to hear the story, make the connection, learn the lesson, and gain the wisdom. Are you ready? Let's get charged and be changed. The Sister Speak Brother Break Show. Conversations on grace, healing, and deliverance. This is Marcy Bush. Come on, let's journey together. Hello, and thank you for joining us today for the Sister Speak Brother Break Show. Our first guest is someone who is near and dear to my heart. Uh, This is the person who's taught me the most about grace, healing, and deliverance. And he wears many hats. He's a husband, a father, the pastor and founder of New Beginning Ministries in Beach Island, South Carolina. He is the bishop of many pastors, covering for many ministry gifts, and the man God has used to bring healing and deliverance to thousands. However, today he has left all those hats at home so that we can learn from the man who's made it through it all. Today, we are talking to Hezekiah Presley Jr., and he's going to tell us about his journey. So we'd like to welcome you, Brother Jr. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. So we'll start at the beginning. Um, Can you tell us what your young life was like? Like, what are some of the things that you remember from your youth or the person that you were as a child? Well, as a child, I had some real serious challenges uh, from my, probably from as far back as I can remember until I got in the fifth grade, my life was wonderful. I had a wonderful mom and dad, Uh, grandmother and granddad uh, treated me like a king. Uh, went to school at a place called Sleeper Hollow. Uh, all the teachers, maintenance people, uh, the the cooks, everybody. We didn't know the difference between the principal and the teachers simply because when we would get to school, everybody would be outside uh, welcoming us to school every single morning. And then in the fourth grade, we ended up doing this celebration called May Day. And I remember how the teachers and the principal hugged us like they wasn't gonna see us no more. Mm -hmm. And I never understood it. And when we got home that evening, we was having a talking call with summertime, but then all of a sudden the community had started having a lot of meetings. And my dad and my mom wouldn't talk to us about meetings, about what was going on in the meetings, but all of a sudden, the atmosphere in the community changed, and I was still had been promoted to the fifth grade. And when school got ready to get started, my dad had a meeting with me. And uh, he said to me, I want you to take care. He called my sister Frog. He said, I want you to make sure Frog is okay. Well, I don't understand that because I'm in the fifth grade. Mm-hmm. Then he gave me orders on how to make sure I take care of her. And my first day of school in the fifth grade, is when the enemy began, began to start unraveling me. Uh, all the kingship I had been taught, how special I was, who, who, who I was from creation, my mom then would tell me that, what great, I was, what great man I was gonna be. And the first day of school in the fifth grade, I get on this bus and I don't even know what integration means. Mm-hmm. And we get on this bus and it's the first time I've had encounters in close proximity with, with people, uh, Caucasian people. Okay. And when they walked, when my mama put us on the bus and we got up the road about a half a mile, it turned. Mm-hmm. And we went from literally being told we was kings, uh, or queens, until the first time I ever even been called the N-word mm-hmm. was I was in the fifth grade. Okay. And it began to start changing me. So by the time I get to school that morning, I'm, I'm getting off the bus. And we done went from in the fourth grade, everybody celebrating us coming off the bus to people hollering, even the adults saying, go back where y'all came from. And I was sitting down the other morning just going back over my life. And, and somebody asked me a question. So Junior, when did your hate start? When did this thing be released in you? Mm -hmm. And it was from my fourth grade to the fifth grade that the enemy began to start 
unnaming me. And when he unnamed me, he kept unnaming. So he had to unravel everything my daddy told me, my mama told me, my grandmama, my granddaddy. So the first year, first year of integration, by the time I finished the fifth grade of integration, uh, I was that angry, mean, spiteful boy that my daddy had gave me the assignment to take care of my oldest sister. And so it, it, it changed me. That's how my that's how my young childhood began to start being reversed because I was a king right, right. to the fourth grade. And then I was an N word wow. in the fifth grade. And for one solid year, uh, teachers would call me the N word. Teachers would allow the, the students to get after us. And, and so what ended up happening was they didn't want us there as people of color. But some of the people, because I have a learning disability, some of the people uh, could learn quicker. So what they did was they moved from isolating all of us until isolating us from one another. Okay. And so the teacher began to start moving the smarter people of color to the front and leaving what she called the dumb N-word in the back. And it, it began to start redoing me. I would imagine so. Yeah. <laughs> What else? Did, so keep talking. What I know you said it, it unlocked that anger, yeah. that hate. What other what other things did you have going on? Uh, low self-esteem. Uh, didn't know. Begin to start not knowing who I was. Uh, I'd go home. I'd ask my daddy. Uh, so daddy. So that's what I am. And he would say, no, son, that's not what you are. But the next morning they would call me that and do this to me. And so it gets to the place where I'm, li I'm living with low self-esteem. I don't have. I don't respect myself no more. I'm, I don't feel good about myself. And so it began to start literally swap. The, uh, the first thing I remember now as a grown man is that it began to start redefining who I thought I was. And it erased it. It erased it. And I, matter of fact, like I said, I was in the fifth grade. And from the fifth grade to the sixth grade, they took me to another school in the sixth grade. The people up there didn't like me. And uh, so it's been a journey. It's, right. been, it's been rough. And I think I've heard you say before, but talk to our listeners. What, what are our viewers, what grade were you in when uh, it was almost like, the, well, when y'all had to walk out? <laughs> when you, when now, you yeah, the walk out, the walk out, I was in the 10th grade. Okay. So that was from the 5th to the 10th. Uh, I'd have to go back and tell you about the ninth grade, mm -hmm. though, because the ninth grade, I was going to another school because they kept moving us. Okay. And I was at this school at North Augusta Junior High School at this time. And at the end of that year, I have got so angry that I told my mama, Mama, you're going to have to move me. I, I'm going to kill somebody, I believe. And she moves me to this school called Jackson High School at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing. Okay. And... The walkout happened because a Caucasian man come to the school with a gun. His son and a guy I knew got into a fight and the guy I knew beat him up and he went home and told his daddy the next morning daddy came with a gun. Mm -hmm. And when he comes with the gun, the guy comes to get me. I'm in school. I'm in class. And uh, he comes to get me and tells me, Hezekiah, there's a guy at the, at the office, got a gun, say he's going to kill me. So I leave the class. The teacher's saying to me, hey, guy, you can't leave. I said, I'm going. Mm -hmm. So we go to the office. And when I go to the office, the principal at the time was Mr. Pewitt. He says, Hezekiah, go back. We're handling it. So I said to him, I'm going back to class and I'm going to give you five minutes. <laughs> and if you don't fix it in five minutes, because this is going on, all this right here mm -hmm. is from the fifth grade. Okay. So it's been a building. It's been building mm -hmm. since the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And so so by the time I get to uh, back to class, uh, I don't even have a watch. I don't, I'm just telling the teacher I'm going to leave again. And so when I leave again, I get on the intercom and we close the school. Down. You got on the intercom? Yeah, on the intercom. And <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Every person of color come out. And they came. And they came. So tell me what made the boy come to you in the first place? Because I was the person that you came to if you wanted <laughs> trouble fixed. <laughs> OK. OK. Yeah. And do you know when that happened? Do you know when 
you became that appointed person. Mm. Truth of the matter is, I became that appointed person when my daddy appointed me in the living room at the house to take tell me to make sure I took care of my sister. And that released in me what now I know was for me going to be a leader. Mm -hmm. But it, it was warped. And so I spent my life, even in school, when I left to go to the school in the 10th grade, I left her at a high school where I left and every day sitting in class, concerned about who bothered her. Okay. And so that's when, that's when it really activated the leadership in me was in the fifth grade. Wow. <laughs> and that just continued to build continued, and build. Continued. Okay. It just continued to build. All, all, even, my, even my uncles, this, a year older than me, they would follow me. I would, uh, my uncle's older than me, they would follow me. But they was following a person that had been misidentified again. And so I, the way I was headed was destruction. Gotcha. So I heard you, I remember you mentioned a learning disability. Yes. How did that affect your life? Well, it, it was, it's... Your young life. Yeah, my young life. For my first four years, first grade through fourth grade, I had the learning disability, but the teachers knew it. So these teachers would literally take the time with me to get me to understand. In the fifth grade, until I graduated from high school, one teacher decided that she would help me through my learning disability. Okay. And so that's in the, from the first to the fourth, I had the ability, the teacher would say, well, it's got to do it this way. But when they integrated the schools and sent me to the uh, uh, fifth grade, then it, it, it literally, uh, it was a tough time. Do you know where, do you know where the rejection came in? Because I know some of your story, like I said, I've been around, I've heard you talk about rejection and things of that sort. Was that also from the rejection from the Caucasians or did you, was it something that was also no, unlocked? No, uh, it, the, the, the thing that happened with me feeling rejected uh, came from the side of my uh, dad's family. Uh, my dad's mom moved in with us. And when she moved in with us, uh, she, she was a tough lady concerning, I would go to my one grandmama and my grandmama would call, said to my mom, Francis, something different about Junior. And then go see my, go home to the grandmama that lived with us, and she would call me you boy. And so it started to reject. We'd have to stay outside. We couldn't, we couldn't go in the house at a certain time. We'd have to play out the door. We couldn't go through the kitchen. We had to go out the front door. And so it began to start, move, start changing me. So now, not only am I going to school feeling this way, but now I'm at the house feeling this way. And it, it, that spirit of rejection got on me real serious. I think around 14, 15 years old, by, four, by 13 years old, I, uh, I, I tried to commit suicide and uh, it didn't work. And then during this time, you're like, I can't even kill myself. Mm -hmm. And so I lived a real angry life then. So now I'm angry because they did me like me did, they did me in the fifth grade, and then the person I thought wouldn't celebrate me is doing me because she's in the house with us, my grandmom is, and so it, it messed me up real bad. Okay. Yeah. Now, and this is another, and I think, I know we're hitting a lot of different areas, but I just really believe that it is all gone to make up who you are, and I didn't think about it until this time, but I also, you talk about the perversion yes. that, that got turned on in yes. your life. Perversion got turned on in my life. I normally say so I won't sound too bad. It got turned on when I was 13, but it really got turned on when I was 12. Uh, my dad, my granddaddy was a mechanic, and so he worked on people's cars, and so he took us to uh, work on a man's car with him. And he sent me to the car to get something. And when he sent me to the car to get something, I opened up the trunk of this man's car and Pornography books was in the trunk of the car. And from that day, uh, 
it unlocked the spirit uh, the spirit of perversion in my life, sexual perversion in my life, and it run my life, okay. run it. By the time I was 15 years old, I was sitting in adult X-rated movie theaters with grown people. Mm. Yeah, just literally in any magazines that right. showed women butt naked, everything. It, it was a tough time, tough time for me. Mm -hmm. And so now you know why. Yes. <laughs> but back then, <laughs> no, no. It was the all of these things yes. playing out. Yes. Yes, and they was playing out in a way, and and then in the in the middle, of, I think it was about twelve or thirteen years old, with all this going on, I found out now since I'm saved, but I didn't know then I was demon possessed, mm. and so the demons were running. I'd hear voices all the time, and I'd have these blackout fits and. And would literally just beat people up and wouldn't even know when I did it and, and would come through and blood would be everywhere. And so it was a tough, tough time. Even sometime now when I'm talking about it, mm -hmm. I have to be careful that the spirit of depression don't get mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. because I'm so ashamed of that part of me. But knowing now that I'm saved, right. that all things work together, yes, but I didn't know that then. Yes, sir. <laughs> It it looked like I was out. It looked like I was gonna die. So when 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 did that start with like the the blackouts and all that stuff? Can you remember when it started? Uh, yes, about about fourteen. Okay. About about fourteen. I remember one time uh, uh, that I went from being this just angry person to this. My uncle and them used to call me the quiet assassin. Mm -hmm. I didn't show a lot of anger, didn't throw stuff, didn't hoop and holler. I would stay calm, but I would be boiling. And I would, and my temperature, my, my anger could go from zero to a thousand at a turn. Mm. But I never hooped and hollered and jumped. And so they never, they, people would know when it had exploded until they would see the results of the ex explosion. To the place where my dad and my mom uh, was so concerned about me. They, they, they one. I remember one morning, good, that I had been in the house in the room all day, and my mama walked in the room to do something in our room, and I was in there and I scared her. Mm -hmm. And she said, "Junior, how long you been here?" I said, "I've been here all day, mama." She said, "Junior, that ain't good. You locking up in this room." And I would lock up in the room, and when I, what I had start doing is, is that I didn't trust myself out in public. Mm -hmm. Now I probably was about fourteen then, fifteen. I ain't trust myself. Nah, I didn't trust myself. Wow. I didn't trust so how that. did your siblings, how, how did, how did uh, they <laughs> handle it? How did they handle you? They, they knew uh, my baby brother, my baby brother, called, my baby brother and the brother next to me, they called me Dundee. And my baby brother would always say, y'all don't mess with him now. And he would always try to, he would always try to keep me calm. But I was a, I was a volcano. I was, it didn't take much to erupt me. And so. Even even to the place at times, I remember me and my middle brother was fighting and he had did something and we started fighting. And my daddy comes out on on the on what we call the garage on the car porch. And he said and he says to me, he said, Junior, stop. You 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 gonna kill him. And I remember my response. Sitting, I remember my response sitting here now when I said to my daddy, I'm trying to. And my daddy went in the house and told my mama, we got to get that boy some help. That boy going to kill somebody. And uh, he would talk to me, but it was un it had already unraveled. I couldn't put I couldn't put the genie back in the bottle. Mm. And uh, it was rough. So was there anybody at that time that could pull that back? In? My my m grandmama on my mama's side. Uh, she had, even when I was a little boy, when, even before I got this far gone, she would always tell my mama that there was something special about me. And she would tell my mama, Frank, I don't know what it is, something special about that boy. And so she would bring me in the house and talk to me. And I remember one day, I was probably about 16 or 17, when the, the demons was bothering me and the anger was bothering me and I was out of control and I left. I left, a hot, left on a motorcycle and my grandmama had a way about 10 o'clock. My grandmama would go to bed. She wouldn't let nobody in her house. <laughs> and so I leave where I'm going, going, where I'm at. And I take off going down the house, probably 17, 18 at this time. 
And I leave going to her house. And when I go to going to her house, she's standing out on her porch. And she says to me, baby, where you going? And I said, mama, something wrong with me. And she, and she said, I've been hearing you about 20 minutes coming down the road on that motorcycle. Baby, where you going? And I said, Mama, something wrong with me because I called her mom. Mm -hmm. I said, Mama, something wrong with me. And she said, this was this. And this is what she said. And I remembered it. I probably about 60, about 17. And she said this. She said, son, you got to get to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I said to my grandmama, grandmama, I know him. And she said, no, son, you got to know him. Mm -hmm. And I said again, I said, grandmama, but I know him. And she said, no, son, you got to know him. And I left her house saying, what in the world is knowing Jesus mean? Mm -hmm. And that thing took me down another road. Okay. And so I'm about, I'm about 17. By this time, I'm dating now what is now my wife mm -hmm. of 41 years. I was dating her then, and I was, uh, it was rough. It, it was. And so she 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 could say some things sometime and kind of calm me when I was dating, when he was dating. But my grandmama was the only person in my early years could kind of reel me back in. So mm -hmm. and my mom, my mama, my mama was my mom was y'all don't bother me. So did they know how to try to you said your daddy said that you needed help. You said you needed help. Mm -hmm. But did at that time mm -hmm. during that day and age, uh, we didn't get no help. I didn't get I didn't get none. They didn't take me to see nobody. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, mm -mm. Okay. My mom, my mama knew, though, my daddy knew that something mentally was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And I sometime even now when I'm in the car, I go back. It was when I from the fourth grade to the fifth grade is when this thing activated in me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. Do you think, because I've heard you talk about this motorcycle accident, how old were you when you had the motorcycle accident? I probably was 19. Okay. 20. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah everything I did, it was, it was 100 mile an hour. And to the place where my uncle and them would get together, and I didn't know this till later, my uncle and them would get together and says. To one another, we believe, and the old people used to talk this way, we believe Junior have a death wish. I think he's trying to kill himself because mm -hmm. my life would be so much on edge. Were you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was trying. I, I was trying, but I couldn't. Everything I, I did. Thank the Lord for that. Yeah, everything I did, it was, it was, it was that way. I didn't care. I didn't care. I, I, didn't, I didn't care about dying. So you were trying to kill you. Do you think? That the enemy was trying oh, to kill I, oh, you, I know or it. was he oh. trying to maim you to leave you, like t physically and mentally I, maim you, or he wanted your life? I don't think he so much wanted my life is that he wanted some results. He wanted me to stay in the earth and not be who I am mm -hmm. now, because I'm 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 more of a threat now that I've gotten better mm -hmm. than I would have been. If if if, if you should live the life that I was living mm -hmm. until the day I got saved, so, okay. yeah. Now, how yeah. important was it for you to have someone who got you, uh, even though they might not have understood what was pushing you? Like those people that knew, like you, like you said, your grandma knew that there was more to you than what was on the surface, and uh, the teacher yeah. who helped you. How how important was that? Oh, I, I believe I believe I'm I'm sane today because of it. Because okay. I I believe the only thing that kept me from losing my mind was those people that would li literally just give me a glimmer of hope that that ain't what I was doing, what I was going through wasn't me. Okay. And that's that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, can you tell us what what was the pivotal point in your life? What was the thing that caused mm -hmm. you to know? Something had to be different. Well, now the, the, now the first thing that happened, I mar ended up marrying, marrying my wife. And uh, I married her when she was 20 years old. I was 23. And I'm still having these anger problems, still having this problem. And my wife goes somewhere and come back home saved. Mm -hmm. 
And when she comes back home safe, I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. And I would sit, I would stand over her while she sleep and watch her peace. Mm -hmm. And literally said to, said to who I thought was God at the time, God, I want that day. I don't even know what that is, but I want to be able to lay down one night and go to sleep and sleep all night. Mm -hmm. And that thing started bothering me. So by this time, my sister, my auntie, and my wife, all of them are in the kingdom now. Mm -hmm. And so they go after me in the spirit. They go after okay. me. Because all of them know me. Mm -hmm. But my auntie and my sister knows me, knows me. And they know I can't continue like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's when it started. Okay. The turn started. Uh -huh. And then I've heard you say, too, when you found out your wife was pregnant. Yes. Uh, she kept, I was at work and, uh, I was in the ditch, uh, doing some work and the Holy Spirit, I knew, I know now said that she was six weeks pregnant. Mm. And so she went to the doctor mm. and the doctor said she was pregnant. And this is what I said when I got the news, she was pregnant. I cannot bring somebody in this world like this. Okay. I can't. And that became my driving force to change, mm -hmm. but it was rough changing. And so I'd have to tell you about my journey to salvation because yes, that's when the things start changing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to hear the journey to salvation. <laughs> we are going to have to wrap it up for this episode, but please join us. Uh, we'll be ending the episode, but we're going to continue the conversation and you can pick up with us next week. Same place, same time. We hope to see you on the Sister Speak Brother Breaks show with Hezekiah Presley Jr. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you've been blessed by today's show, feel free to let us know. And if you'd like to sow into this ministry, become a sponsor or contact us. You can reach us at 803-221-0169 or you can email us at the SSBB show at gmail.com. Let's continue this journey together. Oh, then the hurting of me. I remember one time there was a pastor that did me real bad and God was getting ready. I didn't know it. God was getting ready to use me greater. And this pastor passes by my house and the Holy Spirit says to me, if you let him go, I'll use you, Greg. And I fall on the ground, not because I want to be used. I fall on the ground because I don't want to let him go. He done hurt me so bad, I don't want to let this guy go. And I fall on the ground with the Holy Spirit talking to me. And I, I says with tears in my eyes, not wanting to do it, okay, God, I let him go. 